Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we are here today with our wonderful friend, James Hoffines. How are you, James? I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, we are wonderful. And we're so happy that you're going to talk to us today. This is going to be a really interesting topic, and it's going to be a topic that we've seen in the news recently, and we cannot wait to get started. Why don't we have Landon read your bio really quick, and then we'll dive right in. Okay. Okay. James Hoffheins was born to goodly parents and was raised in the church. He served a mission at the normal age, was actually converted when he was 40. I think a lot of us had that. <laughs> His final calling before leaving the church was in a bishopric in a Salt Lake City ward. Now that he has left the church, he hosts the Latter-day Shamed podcast. So that's a little bit about James. Yeah, welcome, James. He has his Thank own you. successful podcast called Latter Day Shame. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that um, as we get started here? Sure. Um, because I believe shame is built into the culture and the teachings of the church and how we keep each other together, even as members, um, there's a lot of shame. And I've heard so many shame stories. I've solicited stories and my, my inbox overflows. So on my Latter-day Shamed with a D at the end. Latter-day Shamed podcast, I read some of those stories and talk about my own shame, and it seems to help other people. Yeah, I can see that that's very cathartic, absolutely. And I think all of us uh, raised in a high-demand, high-control religion, we all have instances of that. And this is what I'm talking about in the news recently. I'm sure that none of you have missed the story going on with the eight passengers. That's a story unto itself. And then we have the situation with Jody Hildebrandt, um, a therapist who, as I understand it, was fairly instrumental in, in the church, perhaps developing curriculum or sort of having the ear of the church of how to deal um, with people that were in need of counseling or therapy. And of course, this story is just breaking. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things coming out. Um, but recent podcasts on Mormon stories where we're talking to people like Adam Steed, who, you know, have just been devastated by church programs that being sent to you're expecting help, you're hoping to get help and exactly the opposite happens. What have you noticed about that, Landon, in the news and just what's happening with all that, just everything coming to light at once, it seems like. Yeah, there's just uh, been a lot of craziness in the news this week, uh, and and that being one of them. And certainly uh, the reason we've got James on here is because uh, these steps and these programs that the church has used for so many years, although they say are not that they have no affiliation with these people, we find that they uh, are using their programs in many of the cases uh, to to use for the church in lieu of uh, some of the other programs that we would typically see uh, people use. They've kind of taken and, and made their own version of some of the more popular ones, and then they've mixed in uh, some of these, uh, I guess you could call them procedures or... or uh, Tactics. Act, act, tactics, <laughs> yes. Uh, Something, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is why James is on today, because um, he was a facilitator of one of these 12-step uh, programs in a ward. And, and we talked to others about these programs. And, and as we understand it, um, probably 10 years ago, the church was actually using the real 12-step, like AA program. They were using that and kind of hosting it through the church. We talked to a friend who had attended it and it was step-by-step step, regular AA and it was very effective for this friend of ours. And then it seemed like um, from her perspective and she did have some insider information, um, the church started as Landon said to retool this and to make it more gospel centered, um, scripture centered. Although in the regular AA, there is a deity, a higher power, um, <laughs> when we started doing some comparisons, we're noticing, oh, you know, it seemed to be that there just this underlying current subtle shame entered the program a little bit when the church started to add some of their elements and their components. So we thought we would talk to James because a lot of us aren't familiar with how this works. You know, how does this even happen? We'll start from the beginning kind of and find out how one, you know, gets involved in the program, how you're sent to the program, who's running it, and, you know, just a little information, because I didn't know a lot about it. I knew it existed, but not specifics. So tell us, James, how were you called to do this, and what was your experience um, as far as them calling you or choosing you to do this? I think this is very interesting. Right. Um, when, when I was 
as as Landon read in my bio, when I was uh, about 40, um, I became converted to the church. And uh, things went really, really well in my life at that time. Uh, very, very different than what I was used to. And I was talking to my state president about uh, regaining fellowship in the church because I had been disfellowship back in the late 80s, I think it was. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, using using the Book of Mormon and the other teachings of the gospel that I believed in at that time, they really had helped me to come to a point where I felt like I could be refellowshipped and uh, go to the temple and all of those other things. And uh, I wanted to talk to the youth about it, especially young adults, um, and help them understand that there was a path that, first of all, I could help you stay on the path or the things I'd learned. They could stay, help you stay on the path. And if you're off the path, maybe these things would help you to get back on the path. And he suggested instead of doing that, because he didn't want me to, um, how did he put it? Not, not in fact, but he didn't want me to give the idea that you could leave the church for 20 years and sin and then come back and everything would be hunky-dory. Yeah. So he said, instead of that, why don't you talk to, um, to, the, uh, to the people that go to the LDS Family Services 12-step uh, group? Why don't you be, why don't you be a, a facilitator? And so I was called to be a facilitator to the uh to the 12 step group and i was set apart and uh i started uh, attending the planning meetings for for with all the other facilitators and the missionaries and then i was assigned to go to specific uh well they were all in church buildings whether seminary or chapels or whatever not the chapel but ward buildings um i started going and helping to facilitate these meetings so there was a structure. There are two missionaries that, that are over the meeting. They start the meeting. They end the meeting. Um, they call on somebody to give an opening prayer, a closing prayer, and then they turn the time over to the facilitator. The facilitator does his or her or their um, spiel, I guess it is. <laughs> and uh, then, then he asks, he, she, or they ask uh, if anybody wants to share and he picks a person or somebody volunteers and then they just go around the circle and you are sitting in a literal, literal circle on those comfy Relief Society chairs. <laughs> so are these uh, service missionaries or missionary missionaries that are starting the meeting, ending the meeting or a combination of both? I think it was a combination of both. I know, I know at one point we had a former general authority who Oh. He and his wife were uh, missionaries, and uh, I went back and listened to his two conference talks, and they were pretty cool, and he was legit. <laughs> wow, and so they call people to be these facilitators, and so you don't really need any experience in a therapy world or anything. You're just called, and you go through the training. I mean, how long was the training, and how comprehensive did you feel it was? I mean, did you feel you were ready to jump in and do this. It's just, I can't imagine being called. It's such a responsibility. Training? What training? <laughs> there oh, was no training. I, I thought you said that you went through some meetings. Oh, or some yeah. The, as yeah. Structure, things like that. I think that's what yeah, I'm once a, about. Once a week, the missionaries, <laughs> no training. Would, facilitators would, would uh, sit together somewhere uh, in another building and we would have a meeting and just talk about you know, the 12 steps and, and how we can help the, the, the people. Okay. But that meeting was like an hour. Wow. So no background and basically no formal training. You're just going to go in there. It sounds like when they called me to be the organist once and I played the piano, but not the organ. And I tried to explain to them, this is totally different. I am not qualified for this. And I actually turned that calling down because I, and then they volunteered, they said, well, we'd like to send you for organ lessons. You'll go every Saturday for four hours. And I said, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I do not play the organ. I know it's probably, probably not the right thing looking back, but oh my gosh, Landon, do you have any questions about just, just the training or the structure or how you're even called to do it? Well, my question was, what's the purpose of the missionaries? Oh. The purpose of the missionaries is to uh, just make sure it stays on gospel, uh, I believe. Okay. 
But the 12 step program different. isn't, uh, and I don't know if you were, uh, were you using the original AA one or were you using the church one that has the more of this gospel centered rather gospel than just centric, more of, yeah. uh, you know, God as you understand him versus the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost of, of Mormondom? Uh, which, which version were you using? And is the 12 step program supposed to be a religious thing or is so? It, it doesn't seem like you want missionaries there when you're trying to overcome drug addiction. I'm just trying to figure out what the, what the or porn addiction was. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were using the, the, the new one, the modified yeah. uh, where every, like, like you, like you pointed out, you know, higher power versus uh, heavenly father, Jesus Christ, the Holy ghost. Um, also, all sorts of quotes throughout the throughout the manual by general authorities, even some of those old damaging quotes that that we've talked about in the post Mormon world, that talk about things that just make you feel like crap, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's all based on it's all based on the Book of Mormon. I don't remember seeing any scriptures from. Um, from the Bible, uh, Old or New Testament, nor the Pearl of Great Price or Doctrine and Covenants. It was all Book of Mormon based. That That's surprising to me because, you know, you would think a lot of Mormons who might get into alcoholism or uh, drug addiction might get into it because they're feeling an overwhelming pressure to adhere to all the gospel principles. So right. to put them through a program where you remind them that they're not adhering to all of the gospel yeah. principles would seem almost counterintuitive. What was your experience with the program? Did it work? Uh, and, and why or why not do you think it worked? It, I would say it kind of depended on the addiction. For those addicted to porn and, I don't know if I can say the M word, but for people <laughs> addicted to that, it didn't always last very long because that is a very normal, natural human exactly. expression of self-love. Um, so for those, you know, it would go two, three weeks and they'd be okay. I think it worked better with drug, drug addicts and uh, or drug addiction and alcohol addiction. Um, but my experience was I always tried to inject hope because I know what it's like. I remember what it was like feeling completely hopeless. Um, I told my mom one time when she was alive, I said, I don't, I think I've gone too far. I don't think the atonement can do anything for me. I think I've gone over that edge. And so I, I imagine a lot of the, the attendees would feel the same thing. So I always try to inject hope and, and kind of read those steps and talk about as you pointed out, Landon, yes, it's there are gospel requirements and you're already feeling that pressure, but you can do this, you know, and it's possible. And, you know, with uh, with Christ, all things are possible. That kind of uh, that kind of 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 message is is what I was trying to convey uh, all of the time. Right. And that's what people if they're LDS going to these kind of therapies or, or groups, that's what they feel comfortable hearing because that's what they want to hear. But sure. then at the same time, they're hearing, like you said, <laughs> the very damaging where, where it's such gaslighting. You don't really recognize. Why do I feel bad when I hear this? Why do I, why am I not feeling great again? I, I tried to compare the original 12 step with the new newly designed one. And there's just some subtle differences, but one, I think it's even the first one where it says our goal is to return you to a state of sanity. That's the real one, meaning in your whole life. And the goal in the church one is to return you to a state of spiritual health. Well, the church has a very strict definition of what spiritual health is, you know, and there's a lot of things you can do, like you said, that are just completely normal, where you would feel oh, I'm not, I'm not healthy, because you're being told you're not healthy, you know, so to me, these kinds of programs being run by the church are kind of a vicious cycle in that way. And, and I think people maybe leave feeling worse than they, than they started. So, but again, let's talk about how people end up in these in these programs. So 
you and maybe maybe even Landon, you can speak to this more. Um, how does a person end up in one? You go to your bishop. Um, you express a problem, something you want to get over. Either of you, let's talk about how a regular person ends up being assigned or told to go one of these programs. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of experience. I've been in a Bishop Rick, but uh, whenever yeah, that's why I asked you, that's why problems, I asked they, would, they would go to the bishop and the bishop okay. would take care okay. of it. And he's not supposed to share that with his counselors, which uh, I I didn't have any bishop who ever shared that with, with me. So that, that mm -hmm. speaks highly of, of the bishops I worked with. Um, but, uh, I imagine that they confess something to the bishop or, uh, my guess on the pornography is, uh, you know, a lot of guys' wives drag them in there <laughs> and say, yeah. fix him. <laughs> uh, -oh. so, uh, but yeah, James might know that better. Well, yeah, I agree with you that, uh, the bishop almost always keeps that confidential. Uh, the first no, the second bishop I was working with as a facilitator, whole different stake, whole different um, ward. He would, he would uh, kind of give me a heads up on who he has referred to the program. Now, the problem with that is if they don't go to the program, I don't need to know their business, but I do. And uh, that's, that's bad enough. But then... Uh -huh. When you factor in ward council, one of the reasons ward councils exist is to talk about the members and their problems. So sister, sister Q might know that um, brother and sister H are having issues, just like Rebecca mentioned, where he's looking at porn behind her back. She finds out, drags him uh, she, she, she talks to her relief society president, her relief society president brings it up in board council that they're having problems with X, Y, and Z. And can we get them into the 12 step program? So now you've got several people in the ward who know something none of us want or need to know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, whether or not they show up for the program, uh, I actually may not know because if I'm running a regular uh, meeting, if I'm facilitating a regular meeting, they may not go to that one because there are very specific meetings for uh, for porn and masturbation addicts. Um, the women go to one meeting with other women and the men would go to the meeting I facilitate with the male missionary and we would talk about his problem and have no idea what they're talking about on the other side with the women. Is that LDS central or is that, uh, if you went to a program that was, that was non LDS, would the men and the women be in the same room to discuss the issue since they're, you know, so that there's shared, uh, information or do, is that typical to separate them? It doesn't happen with the regular meetings, and I can't imagine, because I, th I think the church has created and manufactured this specific problem, and exactly. the, the, the overpowering shame and guilt that comes along with it, and I don't think you would find a, a, a support group like this for mm -hmm. just pornography and other, exactly. I mean, sex addiction meetings. Yeah, maybe. Um, I've I've never attended one. So, but I, my brother, told me at one point. And I don't know where he got his information. He's passed, so I won't tell his story. But he uh, he 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 indicated that it was all you know mixed. It was co-ed. It was co-ed, and that's what I think too. And I think that the porn and masturbation would fall under sex addiction in the real world. But I also feel that if you went to one of those meetings, they'd probably go, why are you here? <laughs> you know, because again, in most cases, we're talking about pretty normal, pretty healthy, you know, sexual development. And, you know, again, all the shame attached to it. So I guess, so I guess I'm trying to think through the process, you would go to the bishop or you'd be dragged to the bishop and the bishop would say, okay, we need to get you some help. Uh, we have a program here in the stake. Um, you can attend these meetings and they'll help you go over everything. And also I think then the bishop can also recommend like therapy, like one-on-one -on -one 
And I think that is the case in the news with Jody Hildebrandt and all her practices. People were being sent to her um, to participate in her therapy, which turned out to be, you know, <laughs> extremely damaging and life destroying in some cases. So I guess there's a difference being sent to a 12 step recovery program and then also having a one on one. But again, it's your bishop also untrained. That's kind of the I see this pattern here. Everybody's untrained <laughs> who's making these determinations about people and why they need therapy. I mean, I have an experience at BYU that I've shared on other shows where, you know, I'm a normal student. I'm dating. I'm doing normal dating things with my boyfriend, you know, and at one point he feels, you know, oh, I feel some shame. So he goes to the bishop. Next thing you know, I'm hauled into the bishop and the bishop tells me, um, that, and again, I'm doing normal dating things with a normal boyfriend. I have not had sex, but the bishop tells me I'm a sex addict, okay, at BYU, right? As so I'm like, oh, I am? Can you be a sex addict if you've never had sex? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a monogamous relationship. I'm doing normal boyfriend-girlfriend things. And uh, so I was, I was actually sent at BYU to counseling which was really interesting. And this is a professional counselor. They have a whole department to try to help students, you know, and it was written right there on my form, sex addict, right? <laughs> it was just so funny to me. And I, I ended up getting, everybody can tell me if this is TMI, I don't know. I ended up getting a counselor who was not LDS. I don't know how this person was not LDS, but she was working there on the on-campus counseling. And she goes, now, why are you here? And I said, well, you know, and so she started listing off behaviors that she would see with someone that had that problem. She's like, okay, how many people? I'm like, well, I just have a boyfriend. You know, oh, how many? Well, it's just, you know, the more I described it, you could see her just scratching her head. Like she's, you're a normal in your twenties person interacting with your boyfriend. And so she finally kind of figured out what was going on. She goes, look, um, you just need to decide. Your behaviors are completely normal um, for your age and in a monogamous boyfriend, girlfriend relationship. Um, but you're in this environment at BYU. So you need to decide. You're either going to have to change your behaviors to adhere with, you know, what oops, what they want, or you are going to have to, you know, go somewhere else, change schools kind of a thing. So that was my experience. And, you know, she was very upfront about it, you know, but again, she was a trained therapist. But my bishop, going back to my original comment, untrained, labeled me, sent me for that treatment, right? And luckily this person saw for what it was and just kind of made it clear what the, what the thing is, but, but that concerns me, you know, the untrained nature and the untrained nature of, you know, you were untrained, James. I mean, you had the best of intentions. And like you said, trying to infuse hope, that's amazing. But again, untrained. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That everybody out there is helping people with these life decisions and they're untrained. I wanted to ask the question uh, to go along with that. What did they do to pre-qualify these people before they sent them to you? I mean, you know, oh. did, did pornography have to be so many times a week? The first time in your life you ever did it, you're a porn addict. Uh, same thing with masturbation. What was the pre-qualification and the requirements before they were sent to you? And in the case, uh, I think for a lot of husbands, and I think it could go both ways, so I don't want to stereotype it, but, you know, is it, what the wife has a problem with it. So now you have to go to counseling, even though right. you not have a problem with what you're doing. Yeah, correct. Um, and, and you bring up a good point. Um, when I let, when I was leaving the program, I had learned a statistic that women were just as much into porn and masturbation as men. So that, that dynamic was starting to change and we were starting to see more of the women or uh, in the general meetings that I facilitated uh, speaking about their addiction. Going back to your question about what qualified, have you ever looked at porn? Have you yeah. ever masturbated? Guess what? You're an addict. So they've created yeah. that problem. And then when they come to the meeting, the first thing if you're going to share the first thing, and I had to say this every single time, my name is James and I am addicted to porn and masturbation and whatever else may come up, smoking, coffee, whatever. So right off the bat, you know, you're telling, every, you're just putting it all out there so they know. Um, it started out where I was, everybody was expected to say, I am an addict. And I was talking about the hope part of it earlier. I, somewhere during 
somewhere at some point I changed that from I'm I'm an addict to I am addicted to because otherwise it made your addiction your identity. And I talked about that in all the groups after that. And I said, look, this is not your identity. This is something you're dealing with. So if you want to change that the way you say it and think about it, I invite you to do that. And a lot of people did afterwards. And I, I think that eased the burden a little bit. Yeah, there's a huge difference between the two things that you say. You just internalize it. I am this and I can never, you know, I'll always be this. And that's not the case. And I, oh my goodness, just how you describe telling somebody they're an addict. I mean, I, there's so many situations like that. One of the worst I've ever heard was from extended, extended family member, but um, married, the new wife asks, did you ever look at porn before? And the husband says, oh, once in high school, somebody put something in my locker and I saw it, you know, I mean, it was, it was nothing. And the wife said, you are a porn addict. We're going to the bishop right now. And, you know, went to the bishop, the bishop agreed. If he's seen it before, he might look again, you know, and the next thing he knows, he's enrolled in several programs, like what you described. And then he believes he's a porn addict <laughs> when, when in reality, you know, and, and I, I just don't think that he did it very frequently if he did it all, but instantly he was labeled that. I feel that women in the church are raised from the young woman's program on to look for that, to police men, to, you know, see that spot that call them on it and haul them into these programs where I feel like then it's a downward spiral. Once you say I'm an addict, you start believing it and you start acting like it. And we've seen this in the horrible story of Adam Steed where, you know, he believed eventually that he was a, a danger to the people around him, that he couldn't, you know, he separated himself from his family. And I I think you had heard stories like that too before, James, where people start feeling so lowly in these programs that they can't even participate in regular society anymore. They feel very apart and that's not, shouldn't be the goal. How, how do you, have you, have you gotten a sense of people just like kind of spiraling in the program sometimes? And that's completely not the intention. Yeah. Um, I spiraled several times yeah. because, um, wow. because there's, you know, I, I was single. I'm still single. I was divorced um, and hanging around with some uh, LDS singles. And I remember there was a discussion on, healthy sex after marriage. And I felt so dirty just listening to this. I wasn't even participating, but I felt so horrible listening to this because my, my brain that the church told me I was an addict. So yeah. this is not normal. I should not be hearing this, even though it, they were talking about really normal stuff. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I spiraled and I've watched other people spiral. Wow. Did what do you, you think, ever have people in there who uh, didn't feel like they were an addict and said, I, I, I'm not an addict. I'm here because my bishop or, you know, someone I love told me I needed to come um, because I think that would be, you know, you, you're stuck in this. I'm, I, I don't really feel like what I'm doing, but they're telling me I have to come do this. D did you find that or? Um, I think because of the way the culture is set up and all of the peer pressure inside of the meetings and knowing that you're probably going to have to report back to your bishop and all of this other stuff. And maybe your wife's in the other room talking about divorcing you. No, I didn't hear that. Everybody believed they were. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think you're kind of raised to believe that you are, you know, they talk about it nonstop. And, and it's interesting when I talked to this other person who had been in the program, um, it was for food addiction, I think, back in 2014. And she, and she was more of an insider. She said there were really no programs for porn. And I, I would say that, too. It only seems in recent years that that has been, you know, that's the battle cry. Everybody's a porn addict, right? <laughs> because it's such a natural, you know, that and masturbation is such a natural part of, of developing sexuality that it's very easy to control and shame somebody. It's like telling somebody don't blink, you know, oh, you blinked, you're a blinker. Oh no. I mean, maybe that's 
a little facetious, but you know what I mean? When you take something that everybody is going to feel and do because it's a natural part of your development and attach all that shame to it, everybody is going to feel like they need help. Then they're in a system that's confirmed. You do need help. All of you need help. And to me, there's almost no way out. You will always feel that shame until you arrive at the point where you go, there's nothing wrong with me. I mean, I thank that counselor that I saw in college because she said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a normal person. You know, I was so lucky to get somebody that was not LDS. You know, my issue was more, why am I in a system where I, I don't feel like following those strict rules and I don't believe them, you know, so that was my own thing I had to deal with. Um, but yeah, she told me I was normal. My bishop told me I was not. So I don't know. It's, it, I think I'm, gl I'm glad everything has come to the forefront with Jody Hildebrandt because I feel like it's only going to get bigger and the spotlight's really going to be shown on it. And maybe some things can change and some people can be helped, maybe really helped, you know, instead of just lost in this cycle, this endless cycle of the 12-step program that's not doing anything for anyone. I don't know. Did, did you see people that you could tell were helped? Did you see people that were successful, successful, and that felt better on the other side of it? That's that's what I question. Does anyone feel better ever? Yeah, there, there I have seen some success stories, um, specifically people who have been released from jail or prison because they have these 12 step pro programs in the jails and the prisons. Okay. And uh, I've seen some success stories, but also in jail and prison, especially in prison, they have actual counseling and therapy by trained therapists. Yeah. In the church, as you've already pointed out, you've got your really, really good LDS counselors or in your case, a non-LDS counselor. And then you've got your people, you don't know where the heck they got their credentials from. Was right. it you know, in a cereal box, a free inside thing? <laughs> um, and, you know, the church, I, we talk about how the church, um, the culture is to shame each other, which is something that we're inadvertently doing in these meetings, right? And it all starts with the very, very young people, when a bishop gets an 11 or 12 year old boy or girl or other in his office with a closed door, and it's just that child and a maybe 50, 60 something year old man who can start that shame cycle, they can keep you in forever because you need the church to keep you from separating from your family for forever for for example so i've had i've had two really two polar opposite stories when i was about 12 years old um my bishop wanted me to meet with uh somebody from what was then uh lds fam uh, lds social services it's now family services and uh so he he had somebody come over to his office on like a Saturday, I think it was. And my parents drove me down and they were invited in. And, uh, you know, we were just getting to know each other. And I was feeling a little bit weird because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know who this guy was, you know, just some guy with a briefcase and a tie. And uh, while we were getting to know each other, it was my bishop, my parents, me and him. The first, well, the first indication that that things were just going to go off the rails was he asked me in front of all of these adults when I'm 12, how often do you masturbate, Jim? Oh my gosh. I did not know until much later in life that my parents were horrified oh. because, and, and just feeling that embarrassment for me. And, you know, as a child, especially as a Mormon child, you are taught to respect authority. When you're asked a question by somebody in authority, you answer truthfully. So I did. I don't remember anything else of the meeting, nothing. But that's how they locked me in was from then on, I had absolute overpowering shame and guilt just from that idiot's question. And I'm going to I've called him much worse, but I'm not going to use non-Disney words here. <laughs> but he could ruin people's lives. He had that power. And who knows if he was a certified counselor. Yeah. 
And then much, much later in life, um, a bishop referred me to somebody who is not uh, LDS Family Services, but he is LDS. So in, I mean, if you're worth, if we're thinking like with the Jody Hildebrandt thing, you know, they have recommended people and this was in Salt Lake, Salt Lake area. So, you know, it was Mormon and they could have sent me to LDS family services, but they sent me to this guy. He was absolutely wonderful. He knew his stuff. He was, I think he, I think he had a, a, a master of social work. And uh, he was just great. We met in his, he had an, uh, a basement in his office, uh, an office in his basement. We met there and we talked and things got accomplished up here and in my heart. And it was really, really good. And sadly, that man is no longer with us. So I can't go see him anymore. Oh, but he made a huge difference. That's oh, the thing. So it it, yeah. can, it can be life-saving, but then on the opposite, it can be life-destroying as we're starting to hear people's stories coming about out about just reckless therapy, right? That is yeah. that is doing no good whatsoever. Yeah, and we know Jody lost or her suspend her license was yes. suspended for uh, breaching confidentiality. I had a bishop early on who I was. Uh, let's say being normal with a young lady, I was, uh, this is what led up to my disfellowship. And actually, um, I was 22, she was 21. And um, my bishop called me in for something else. And I confessed because, you know, the guilt. And yeah. so after I confessed to my bishop, my bishop called her bishop and her bishop called her parents she was an adult. <laughs> what? There was no reason for that. He totally breached confidentiality. And you can imagine that was the last time we saw each other. Yeah, that there's so much of that. I hope they're more careful now, but I have so many stories like that from college. I actually had a bishop who had a, it ended up being a brain tumor, a condition, and he was not quite with it. And he he would get people confused who came into him and then he would tell other, you know, like he would tell my roommate, oh, don't date that boy. He has an illegitimate child. Well, he was getting that boy messed, mixed up with another, you know, he was, he was telling tales that were not correct. Yeah. And, and he did a lot of havoc and I was, I wreaked a lot of havoc and I was a victim of his too, you know, so this whole confidentiality thing. Did you ever have, um, when you were facilitating, anybody try to get information from you when they were, because you, you're not supposed to, or are you supposed to report on how the people are doing back to the bishop or, that referred? I guess the, that's a good question. Or how does that the missionaries work? that were there. Yeah, the or the missionaries. What's the confidentiality to... level there, or the exchange of information? The confidentiality is absolute. That's one thing that the LDS Family Services 12-step program did really, really good was enforced confidentiality. In fact, back then, I don't know how it is now, but back then, if you breached somebody else's confidentiality, you faced church discipline. So oh, you could- They took it seriously. They took it very seriously. I had a bishop who uh, <laughs> tried to pester me a few times. Hey, did, did so-and-so show up to the group? I, I, I referred him and I just refused. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell him. And he was pretty frustrated. Now, granted, anybody could come in to the group, like your state president or your bishop or relief society president, they could come in and join. Um, but that really shuts down sharing for anybody who has to report to that. Shuts so, down sharing, to put it lightly. Yes, it would if your bishop walked in and sat right beside you when you're trying right. to talk. So, oh right. my goodness. Yeah, wow. so... Yeah, leadership sometimes showed up. I had a really good state president that was really on board with all of this and really took it seriously. And he would sometimes come in just, excuse me, my co-host is trying to interrupt. Oh, I love your co-host. Oh, this is what's your co-host's name? Major the Cat. Oh, the cat. Our producer of Mormonish is my cat, Todd. So <laughs> I get it with the cats. <laughs> your, your cat who? Todd. <laughs> oh, I thought you said Tom. Okay. No, anyway, no, that would be so, funny. No, Todd. So, but uh, yeah, you um, anybody can show up, but yeah, confidential confidentiality is absolutely something I can't say, but absolutely enforced with the uh, 
with the 12 step program. Did, you, well, you, that's good, it's least. interesting to me because th this was one of my frustrations when I when I left the church or when I was going through a faith crisis was the church had a 12 step program for masturbation, for pornography, for drug addiction, for alcohol. They didn't have one for faith issues. Did you ever see right. that uh, or did anyone I, I, I imagine that was not part of the program? No, but damn wouldn't that be great if they did just wouldn't have, that be great <laughs> just have a just have a weekly meeting or even monthly where people just get together and talk about questions and have somebody in authority there who will give real answers and stop the gaslighting well that, that was what was nope. it, is you know you're supposed to have the answers for me and uh, uh, there's no program for this uh, mm -hmm. uh in fact everyone was you know the opposite i almost feel like let the porn go <laughs> De yeah. deal with doctor you're a church deal with the doctrinal issues you know uh uh because that's also a problem uh that that i feel like the church created uh their own problem there uh with what they've done so uh but on on the positive side of that though um you know we we talked to some other people who've been in this and you know the, their point was well a lot of people in order to get drug addiction treatment or whatever they had to you know mortgage a home or second mortgage in order to pay for that kind of counseling yeah, yeah. the church tries to do it you know on the cheap um but on the other hand it gets help to where other where people may not get help did you find most of the people coming were from your stake or ward or were they free to come to whatever one they wanted to uh so that they weren't necessarily so they were more uh, anonymous so there's a uh, there's a schedule that the church um, has online now where you can put in your zip code and you can find a meeting near you. So let's say I'm uh, vacationing in San Diego, but I really need to go to a meeting. So I would go to the church website and I would find a meeting close to me in San Diego. So it was a mix. There were a lot of people from my state, um, but also a lot of people who would say, you know, I'm in town for a couple of weeks on business or whatever. And, uh, you know, everybody was welcome. How did you finish the program? Was it just uh, up to you, uh, your own autonomy? Did you say, I feel like I'm okay? I mean, or was there an amount of time you have to attend for three months? How did how did you exit? The, or maybe some people never exit. <laughs> maybe that's the shame cycle, right? You never exit. Um, right, as a, as, a, as a participating member, you're probably there for life or until you finally realize I've had enough of this shit. It's not real. <laughs> James said it. He went there. <laughs> and that's kind of how it ended with me. I was, I was taking care of my elderly dad at the time. And he had it in his mind one night that I was supposed to facilitate that he wanted to go to a restaurant that we both love and I would have to drive him. And so I blew off a meeting. I just, I didn't call anybody. I didn't text anybody. I just didn't show up. And after a few weeks of that, I felt like, you know what? I'm done. And I just never went back. I never contacted anybody about it. I just yeah. stopped because it was really, it was damaging. It was really damn it. It was putting me back into the mindset of being an addict. And I didn't like that. I wasn't, and I'm not. I'm not an addict. <laughs> there you go. I'm James, and I am not an addict. Wow, look at that. Right here on Mormonish. No, but I understand, and I'm not making light of that at all. I understand no, no, no. what you're saying, because you don't, you know, you're suddenly told that you have this problem, and you suddenly yeah. feel that shame. And there's a big difference between shame and guilt. You know, shame is so sure. internalized. It's you as a human being you know, shame to your very core, guilt is perhaps something over, you know, a specific thing that you've done. I feel guilty. It's easier, I think, to rectify guilt to get over that, but the shame that, you know, you're just a broken, broken person. And where can you be fixed? The only place is in the institution. And then it's just the cycle and you don't know 
why you don't feel better. You just don't know why. We, of course, on the other side, see it. We see the harmful quotes. We see the gaslighting. We see the speaking out of both sides of your mouth. We see the passive aggressiveness that just wreaks havoc with your brain. But like you said, James, until you step away and you clear your head from that, you don't recognize. You think that you're hearing the good things that you help you. Then you feel more shame because they're not helping you. What's wrong with you that I'm feeling bad about this? And it's just spiral, spiral, spiral. And I think kids are particularly vulnerable to this. I hate it when I hear stories of kids that are trapped in the cycle of feeling that they're unworthy and they're not worth it. And I've talked before about my oldest son who had such a you know, problem with bishop interviews and would have panic attacks over it, you know, and, and luckily I was sensitive enough to it to say, okay, don't go anymore. But I know a lot of parents would, because you're trained to think yep. that's the only help you can get instead of realizing that this is literally killing me inside. And so for the kids, I worry too. And so I think maybe that's the one positive coming out of all these news stories and Jody Hildebrand is just, let's look at this. Let's look at what's really happening. Is this helping? Is this hurting? More people like Adam coming forward. And, and I've seen comments on that. More, If you haven't watched the Mormon Stories episode, it is rough. I haven't even yes. been able to get all the way through it. Um, I'm kind of watching it in bits and pieces. And I'm kind of reading the comments to get the story because I also suffered that kind of interference in your life at BYU. I suffered those kinds of threats, you know, to your education, things like that, if you weren't living how they, you know, the honor code and that kind of stuff. So it's very triggering for me, but I still encourage everybody to try to watch it because yeah. it needs to be seen as the Adam Steed episode about his life was literally shattered by leader after leader, after general authority, after therapist, and because he continued to be in the system because that's where he thought he belonged. And that's the only place you think you can get help. So like you say, James, whatever it is, makes you step aside and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know? I am not, like you said, I'm not, whatever, fill in the blank. I am not right. what they are telling me I am. So, and I love that you now have created this podcast where, and it's an audio at this point, audio only, right? But yes. who knows, maybe someday where you just collect these stories from people um, who have had these experiences and it must be very cathartic for them to share. And it must be very cathartic for you to share. And what, what's what been the feedback from people who are listening? What are what are they telling you? Because again, like I think cathartic, I think for everyone involved. Except for one person who's heard about my podcast, it has been absolutely overwhelming positive. Oh. And, uh, you know, Bre Brene Brown said that the difference between guilt and shame is uh, guilt is I did a bad thing. Shame is yeah. I am this bad thing. Yes. Thank you for and, quoting that. Yep. And that's that's what the church perpetuates is that shame. And I've heard so many good reports about the podcast and about the stories I share because people are able to say that's that what that's happened to me. And in some cases, for all of their lives, they've never really known or well, really known anybody else who's been through that shame experience that, that I talked about or that other people have written their stories about, because when you're in that, when you're in that shame tunnel that goes forever and ever and just strengthens, um, you don't talk about it to your friends. They don't talk about it to you because it's shame. You don't want to, you don't want to open yourself up to that kind of judgment that you're already feeling from the institution. Yeah, so I'm it's sure been that's positive, very true. Positive results, positive. Oh, I think that's great. And so everybody can find you just on any podcast platform, right? You're just out there everywhere. And yes, it's Latter called Shame. Latter day Shamed with a D. With a D. End. Yes. And if they wanted to reach out and contact you with their own story or just to find out more, how can they do that? Latter day Shamed at gmail.com it's been a oh, while that's since pretty I, easy you know, yeah no i yeah. know and we'll put that in the show notes because yeah okay. if anybody would like to reach out to james to share a story or find out how to share a story um yeah. or maybe just to chat right to a like-minded individual because sure. yeah, yeah what you're doing is really important and your experiences on both sides of things being as you say an addict and then being somebody that facilitates these programs seeing what they're trying to do attempting the positive, 
seeing some of the negative results and, and just dealing with people, you have a lot of perspective, which is why we, we are so happy that you were able to come on today. Any last thoughts, Landon, on this topic that I know everyone is going to be covering and talking about for months to come? This is just the tip of the iceberg. It's all just starting to come out now. Yeah, I just think it, you know, it's important that when you have an addiction that you be able to go and get the resources that you need, but likewise to create an addiction to make you codependent on it on an institution to me is immoral. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I think it's great when you provide a, a, an addiction service, but we also need to be careful that, uh, th that we pre-qualify that, that, uh, uh, you know, these things are not, <laughs> some of these things you, you won't even hear of outside the church as an addiction because they're not defined as an addiction exactly. by anybody else, uh, but only by, by members right. of the church. And that that's where we need to be careful. And that's where I think some of these recent therapists that are, were L, RLDS uh, causes a problem. So. Yeah. Very, very Can I mention one Any more? final thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say final thoughts, Gene. So um, you can also find Latter-day Shamed on Instagram, also at Latter-day Shamed, um, okay. just for that. And I want you to know, I'm going to look in the camera. I want you to know, that if you have ever felt shame because of something a leader or another member has told you, you are not that. Your identity, if you're still believing Mormon or not, is a child of God or a child of the universe. Either way, you are exactly perfect just as you are. Take that home. Oh, I love that, James. Oh, my gosh. That's just this, such a perfect sentiment. And I'm glad that you looked right in the camera and said that because I guarantee you somebody listening or watching today needed to hear that. And I hope they take that to heart because we all feel that way here on Mormonish that everyone is a valuable person absolutely valuable and much needed and much wanted and much cared for. So, well, this was a kind of a difficult episode to talk about, but needs to be talk about, talked about. And like I said, I believe we're going to be seeing more and more coming out about this. And I feel like we're going to have to kind of walk through the fire on it. There's going to be a lot of hard things to hear, hard stories told, but then hopefully coming out on the other side of it, uh, with better practices, better programs, better information, real information, right? Not pseudoscience, <laughs> real therapies, real answers um, to help people return to health, return to sanity. Like it says in the actual, uh, the actual 12 step program, when you say return to spiritual health, um, that can be very subjective, right? And when the institution tells you what you must do, these steps for spiritual health, and that's not you, you're in the cycle and you're in the system and it's not going to end well. So um, please comment. Let us know. Have you experienced shame in the institution? Uh, do you have stories of perhaps attending one of these 12-step programs? Have you yourself been a facilitator like James of this 12-step program? I know lots of people have. I mean, I think now we're going to find out more about all these programs and what they actually do. So please comment. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like to um, be made aware when our episodes come out, you can hit the uh, notification bell. Also, if you'd like to help support uh, Mormonish financially, uh, we have links in the show notes on how you can donate uh, to support financially through PayPal or Venmo because we just appreciate everybody so much who does you know who you are you guys are awesome and we will sign off again uh this time for mormonish thank you landon thank you james thank you all our listeners and viewers have a great day everybody bye-bye thanks for joining us for another episode of mormonish we really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share you can email us at mormonish podcast at gmail.com you can also find us on facebook instagram and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.